Hello, Austin, uh, Houston. Um, we were partway through our, our um, psychotherapy today, and um, we're going to try to give you the help that you clearly need at this point um, in the semester. We had dropped out um, at the end in a clutter of words as, in, as we were in the midst of talking about um, systematic desensitization. I won't go back over everything that we talked about, but simply point out to you that systematic desensitization is one of the behavioral therapies and there is a series of steps that you typically go through when participating in systematic desensitization. In essence, the underlying logic of the, of the therapy is simply that anxiety as a driving force among the traditional neurotic uh, disorders um, typically has associated with it a lot of muscle tension. And so in essence, what this therapy sets about to do is to remove the most common symptom. That is, we're going to put you through a system of deep muscle relaxation exercises, an example of which I'm going to give you here in just a minute. We tried a mini one at the end of the last tape. We're going to do it for real this time. While I'm talking, what I want you to do is to clench your jaw muscles very tightly right now. I want you to really clamp down to the point where you're going to start experiencing aching muscles here before too long. Just do that for a couple of minutes, um, and I'll get to it in just a couple of minutes explaining what, what we're doing by way of that. So the first thing that happens in this therapy is that you list the anxieties that, that are, are, are what are bugging you, in essence. And then the second element is, and there may be 250 things that are listed. Each of them is put on a, some kind of easily manipulable, like three by five card or something like that. And then they're rank ordered from least to most anxiety provoking. And then once we've got it all rank ordered, you don't like to think about snakes. You don't like to talk about snakes. You don't like to see snakes. And there is no way on earth that you would actually touch a snake. That might be your rank order simply represented. Now what we're going to do is to put you into deep muscle relaxation. Are you clamping down on your jaw muscles as, as requested? Okay. What we do with that portion of the therapy is to start at one end of the body or the other, and we give you practice in tensing the muscle as much as possible. The purpose of this is not so much to teach you how to tense muscles, but rather for the second phase, which is when I give you permission, what I want you to do now is to relax those muscles. So right now, you might be working with a fist, your head, you know, wrinkling your eyebrows, flashing your ears, putting your ears back against the back of your, your head, whatever. But we'll start at one end or the other. Maybe you're clinching your toe muscles at the other end if we start at that end and work up. But the point is that we're going to work progressively from one end of the body to the other, system by system, get you to experience what it's like to tighten those jaw muscles up, whatever set of muscles. And now I'm going to give you permission to relax the muscles. So the ones that you've been tensing previously, I want you now to relax. And I don't see a single person in the room here who did what they were instructed to do. Not a single person. And the reason is that your jaw is hanging out over nothing. Okay? And the fact is that your mother told you years ago, keep your mouth shut or you'll catch flies, right? And every one of you, when I gave you specific permission to relax your jaw muscles, an authority figure telling you to relax your jaw muscle, you still kept that mouth shut, which means you're not following the instructions. One person is shaking her head, but in your case, what you did was, that's not relaxing. That is, in fact, exercising the other muscles. We'll get to those later where we force you to keep them open. But in fact, nobody actually did what I said, which was relax the muscles. And the reason, of course, is you're tense. You've got exams coming up. So I want you to, no, we won't go into all that. But in fact, it would take some practice. The first two or three tensings and relaxations will normally take some time. But in fact, what you did not do, truthfully, was actually relax the muscles as I instructed you to. Because if in fact you had, then your jaw would literally have fallen open. And it did not. So we would clearly have some work to do if, if uh, I were a therapist and you were in therapy. You aren't and I'm not, so you can relax. But the point is that we do in fact have to go through several different muscle groups. And eventually you, you begin to, you meaning the patient, the therapist, the, um, the um, client, begins to gain an understanding as, as to what is meant by relaxing the muscles. So having gone through a complete set of, of systematic deep muscle relaxation training, now what we do is to jump to the last phase of the therapy, which is the actual desensitization. And in essence, what we're going to do is to put you and pick, for instance, a, a particular example. Here, we'll start out with, with um, thinking about, about relaxing. And so in essence, in this case, what we're going to ask you to do is to relax. 
and think about snakes. And if you are in the reclined position and you're able to actually think about snakes, then what I'll ask you to do probably is to, is to uh, give me a sign, like for instance, if your hand is in a relaxed position, we may ask you to raise your finger in some way. So if your hand has been on the, the arm of the couch and you're past the point of thinking about snakes and the next most uh, anxiety evoking thing for you is to talk about snakes, I might then ask you as a sign, just raise your finger. And that, now again, notice that's a slight tensing of the muscles which is okay, because in this instance that's a signal that you're relaxed enough that you can move on to stage two, which is talking about snakes. And while you're in that relaxed state, your finger is raised, that's a cue to me that I can talk about snakes, and I will then start talking about snakes with you. If at any point you are not able to handle that, the instructions then are retreat back into deep muscle relaxation, that is practice the relaxation muscles uh, techniques that we've practiced. And in essence what we're going to do then is to systematically excuse me, systematically decondition you. So in essence, in, in the next stage, um, what we may do then, after going to the, um, after going to the um, um, thinking about the, the difficulty, now what we'll do is move to the second one, uh, talking about snakes. Now obviously this is a very abbreviated list that I'm dealing with here, but if in fact you can handle that, um, your finger will remain in the raised position. If not, if the finger, if you're forced to do deep muscle relaxation, I'll change the subject and talk about something else. So you, in fact, control what's going on. As you get relaxed and are then comfortable talking about snakes again, the second one in your hierarchy, your finger will come up, I will switch back to talking about snakes and so forth. And in essence, although it's a very complex therapy, the fact is that in most cases you don't have to go through all 200 or 250 cards because you're teaching the patient, the client I should say, a new skill and that is when faced with anxiety, simply relax. And it's based on the idea that the, the tension that we normally have as part of anxiety is, is inconsistent with being relaxed. And so in essence, what we're actually doing is, is counter-conditioning you. Another phrase that is sometimes applied to this form of therapy is counter-conditioning. The elements that used to cause you to tense up now are supposed to cause you theoretically to actually relax. Um, there's another example of this kind of, of therapy, and that, is, um, and that is what's called implosive therapy. Implosive therapy is, is a, um, a very different form of therapy. Let me jump ahead one line here and see if we did in fact talk about it. I'm going to critique both of them here in a minute. In implosive therapy, what we're going to do is to operate on the assumption that in fact these anxieties are non-threatening to you ultimately. And so in essence, if you have a problem with, with um, uh, snakes, for instance, what we're actually going to do is to uh, take a basket with a snake in it, put it on your lap and ask you to take that snake out. We want you to play with that snake for an hour. We are going to let that snake crawl in one sleeve and out the other sleeve. We're going to have you look at that snake, kiss that snake, feel that snake, hold that snake, do anything we can think of to have you do with that snake over and over and over again. And in fact, what this theory is, is driving toward, created by Thomas Stamfel, is to literally create an internal explosion of energy. You're going to be very nervous. You'll have big sweat bands under your arms. You will be beaded with perspiration by the time you're done. You're going to be driven. This is not a therapy for the faint of heart, trust me. But the point is that it's, it's leading toward another form of therapy that, that has become quite popular in the last 20 years or so. It's essentially a cognitive approach. Because after making you as anxious as we can for an hour, what an implosive therapist is going to do is point out to you, look at all the worry you've put into this. Can you understand that the snake is even more terrorized than you are? And that in fact, really, most of the difficulties that you're having are self-generated that in fact the snake has not bit you, it has not strangled you, it has not wrapped around your arm and squeezed your wrist off. Um, and in fact, in, in essence, the, the, um, the problems with these types of, of, um, of therapies result, for instance, in, in the difficulties in, in learning about trying to, trying to exercise the link between systematic, dema, uh, systematic relaxation of the muscles and doing that every time you, you feel an anxiety. Um, there are other difficulties. You may not identify all of the things that are causing you ang uh, anxiety, and in fact, you may be very unskilled in actually rank ordering them. So this, theory, this therapy, this general form of therapy, puts a lot of, a lot of um, um, confidence in the, the client, him or herself. Um, and if you have difficulties with imagery, uh, that will be a problem with systematic desensitization. Certainly with implosive therapy, it won't be, because the object you fear most is right there in your face. Um, but it is nonetheless a, a um, we have to, with implosive therapy, use some degree of caution in actually broaching these particular types of, of therapy with you. Um, 
and patients do vary. Some benefit, some are terrorized by it, uh, some may actually be worse afterwards. So the, the, the choice has to be judicious, um, even though it is generally acknowledged that most people are actually better following this therapy. In the interest of time, let me just skim the elements of, of operant therapy, which is essentially a pure behavioral slash reinforcement based um, uh, therapy. The therapy itself is going to involve creating, first of all, a token economy. This will work particularly well, for instance, in a state mental hospital or in a, in a, a teacher classroom, um, a, a classroom with a teacher. Um, the token economy sets up a reward system which spells out in detail what you get for what you do. So we, we quantify the data in terms of what are the responses we're looking for and what rewards will you get. In a classroom, for instance, sitting quietly, paying attention, do as instructed, not talking to other students, these are the kind of things that are rewarded activities. And our economy may indicate, for instance, that, that you'll get a gold star every time you do you know, quiet for an hour, reading to completion, the assignments have been given, and so forth. So a teacher is walking around with a large number of gold stars that she will literally put on your notebook as, as things are going on. In turn, there's then a translation chart in the room where the, the various points that are necessary to gain each of a variety of, of rewards are there. Everything from an extra time out at recess, I mean an extra recess period, um, rulers, pencils, uh, you know, kind of academia um, rewards, all the way up to more extensive things such as um, um, movies, for instance, the, the ability to participate in movies or, or in some cases uh, community uh, agencies will get behind it and, and offer, you know, uh, trips to Kmart, although I guess it's run them broke doing that, so maybe that's not so good a reward. But in any case, um, we have a timeout also um, where in fact you may actually be pulled out of the activity because you don't have the right in that kind of a classroom activity to hinder the ability of others to gain points. So if you start acting out, you may in fact be removed from the activity and put in a timeout. You can still participate, that is you can still benefit from the classroom instruction, it's just that you can't earn rewards when you're in timeout. And ultimately then it's based on contingency contracting. If you do A, I will give you B. And the B is basically the points and the rewards that are, that are associated with them. It's a very interesting, very effective form of therapy when you have control of the, um, of the um, uh, reward structure in a room or in, a, in an arena. That can be difficult to achieve in some kind of free-flowing free environments. For instance, the University of Houston, it would be almost impossible to do a token economy system here because of how free-flowing the, um, the classes are. Um, the, the treatment approach is, is quite precise here. Um, it's very economic of time and cost and people, um, and it does depend on, on the principles of learning. The success rate really uh, varies quite widely as a function of the extent to which the, the conditions, first of all, will be tolerated by people and secondly participated in openly. But the benefits can be quite, uh, can be quite substantial. I'm not going to spend any particular time going over this, but, but um, it is in the book and, and the, the general idea here is that one of the biggest problems we've had with psychotherapy is vague criteria. When you try to get a psychoanalyst at one extreme and a behaviorist at a, at a kind of an opposite, different kind of extreme to agree on what the criteria are for what's the illness and how do we cure it, um, you can begin to see the problems that we have with evaluating psychotherapy. Even getting people to agree on the criteria can be difficult. The psychotherapist, him or herself, is typically a very biased uh, uh, evaluator of the success because they can't very well go around shooting themselves in the foot saying, well, this therapy really doesn't work. So in, in some ways, perhaps the best person is, is the uh, relatives, the bill paying relatives of the, the patient or client to evaluate whether in fact therapy does actually, um, does actually work. Oftentimes it's very difficult to establish specifiable controls. Um, there are theoretical clashes as I've already talked about and, and the, the bottom line is the, the, the bottom line here is do these, uh, do these therapies actually work and generalize to, to life as a whole? Those are issues that will, um, that will haunt us into, the, um, into at least the near term future. Now let's get into the last major section which is basically social psychology um, and look at a very important question and that is how does a social psychologist's perspective on a group differ from a sociologist's? Is there any single important difference between the two? And the answer, in the interest of time, would be yes. The primary difference is that a social psychologist is still studying an individual. So in a group situation, which is what we normally have when we're talking about social psychological phenomena, the social psychologist is still concentrating on the individual. In this particular instance, um, 
he or she is concentrating on the individual in a group situation. And we expect different kind of situations to, or different kind of responses to evolve here. A number of years ago, uh, Phil Zimbardo was the guest of my students here in, on campus in, in an on-campus class uh, meeting. Um, I've known him for 25 years, a um, um, long time. And the day I introduced him, I gave him a very effusive, very positive, warm introduction because I appreciate what he's done in, as a psychologist over the years. And when he got to the microphone, he returned the favor. And what he did essentially was to compliment some of the things that I've done down through the years. And when he was finished, he turned to the class and said, uh, how many of you agree with, with my assessment of Dr. Cashel? And there was a round of applause. And then he said, his actual point. Well, look, we've got 30 seconds or so. Who'd like to come up to the microphone here and talk to the 700 uh, who were applauding um, about the specifics of why you actually endorse what I just said? 700 people applauding, three hands went up, okay? One of which, of course, was mine. But in that situation, the actual purpose of his demonstration was to exactly identify what he, or, or illustrate what he did there, which was to create an audience effect. It's very easy for you and, a, and I to identify it to a join 700 other people, all of whom are applauding anything. But if it then turns around where you now have to stand up and justify why it was that you were applauding, that's a very different effect. That is but one of the instances of, of an audience effect where, where us being in, in groups may, may very much impact how we will actually behave. Um, the social psychologist then is looking at the individual in a group situation. The sociologist, on the other hand, is looking at the group as a whole. Okay, so they, one of the primary differences then is the unit of analysis, which for, for the psychologist is going to still be the individual, even though now he's, he or she is functioning in a group situation. For the sociologist, on the other hand, the unit of analysis is the group as opposed to the individual. There's a second also important difference, and that involves research techniques. Psychologists can perform true experiments, that is, actively manipulate independent variables and study the effects on the dependent variables. Psychologists can also use naturalistic observation as a separate technique, but sociologists are limited to that, just given the nature of what's being studied and how it's being studied. Traditionally, psychologists can use both experiments and naturalistic observation. Sociologists, on the other hand, are limited specifically to naturalistic observation of group behavior. Ever participated in a tug of war? That is the ultimate group activity. And all of the major elements of, of, uh, of groupness are represented in that kind of an activity. Um, and in essence, um, what we're talking about when we define a group is basically two or more people who are interacting. They're in a face-to-face -face relationship. Communication is part of it. Identification with common goals and so forth is also part of it. But those are the major elements of what constitutes a group, as we're going to um, define it here. And there are basically kind of three common critical elements that are going to be present in any group situation. One of these is interaction and communication. In order for there to be a group, there has to be interaction among the members, between or among the members of that group. It's crucial to the operation of the group. The second is feelings of belongingness. That is, individual members of a group, when asked, will identify with the group. If it exists in any formal sense, you will identify with it. That is illustrated in various ways. Uh, fraternity brothers and sorority sisters on campus here wearing pins or sweatshirts that identify with the group to which they belong. Um, if you're in the scholars community on campus here, you tend to have scholars community paraphernalia that you're, that you're, that you're with, so that, that you have. So there are a variety of ways of, of illustrating that you and I identify with the particular groups that, that we may belong to. And the third thing is that we identify with the goals of the group. That is that as a, being a member of the group, we actually identify with what the goal of that group actually is. Um, so that there are common goals. Would this be a group? Would the members of a protest march Downtown, be a group. On mic. Yes. Very good. Yes, they would be. There's interaction. I mean, how embarrassing it would be if everybody took a left at that corner and you and your sign took a right. That won't work, okay? You are then a protest individual. Um, so in essence, there is interaction. There are common goals expressed by the, by, the, uh, by the signs, and the fact that the members of this group are carrying those signs clearly indicates that they identify with the, the common goals and, and the interaction that's going on. How about the workers at a construction site? No. Yes. I would say yes. 
50-50, that's still not a bad grade. Uh, <laughs> I would say yes. They have the common goal of getting the building up, getting paid, and getting out of town before it collapses. There is a lot of interaction that goes on in achieving that goal, and in fact there is obvious member identification with the goal in the fact that they've all got to wear the hard hats or the thing that says Butler Construction or whatever it says. So I would argue that that is in fact a, um, a group also by our definition. Well, it can be multitask, which I'm going to get to in, in a couple of minutes here, but roll with me for a minute and, and allow me to say that that is a group in the traditional sense, because there is interaction, there's a common goal, and the people in that group identify with it. But how about the people waiting at a crosswalk to cross a street downtown? No. Is that a group? No. Is that a collection? Yeah. No. Yeah. Somebody needs to get on microphone. <laughs> Okay, I'm so proud then. We'll say it. Okay, I'm going to argue, no, that it's not a group. And the reason I'm going to argue that is that, that there is a common goal for sure, okay, getting across the street, okay, without getting killed, all right? But there's no group to identify with. There is no cluster there. You don't see anybody walking around Houston with a shirt on it that says Milam Rusk Crosswalk Group, okay? That just doesn't happen. Um, about the closest I would suggest to this collection, which is what I'm going to argue we actually have here, that, that might actually convert momentarily into a group is that, that I have season tickets to basketball. And when a basketball game lets out, when a crowd lets out at, at uh, Hofheinz Arena, um, they will come to uh, the crosswalk at Cullen and, and uh, what is it, at Holman uh, there, when, when people have parked across the street in, in the SNR lot, in the science and research lot. And if too many people back up, if the officer who's controlling that intersection is too slow, in, in uh, getting the walk to the allowing the, the crosswalk lights to change so that we can get across legally. Um, if enough people back up there and there's a break in the crossing traffic, if somebody steps out onto the street, almost invariably the entire crowd will then go. And that really for a moment then is a group. There is a common goal that we're identifying with. Why aren't you letting us go across the street? The us is the group there. You know, you'll lose a kid or two on the edge, but most of us get across safely under those, um, under those uh, conditions. So that's a collection, except in, in rare instances. Now the obvious question is, why do groups exist? And there are a lot of different answers to that. One is a need to affiliate, to belong. Henry Murray's theory talks about that at some length. Just a general need to affiliate. A second is the sharing of information. You and I benefit today because of the work of Thomas Alva Edison years ago generating lights, and we now use lights all the time. That information has been packaged and, and become part of our, our um, collective consciousness, if you want to think about it that way. But in essence, we, we um, communicate with each other and share information in groups. A third is rewards. A reward structure often is implicitly part of a group. Um, if you were to get um, a, an award for being on the honor roll at Texas Tech, it wouldn't mean a whole lot to you as a student at the University of Houston. But on the other hand, be, being noted as, as part of the dean's honor list um, here on campus is, is a reward for you. It says that the institution collectively values what you've done. Um, teaching awards that are given by, to uh, faculty are the same kind of thing. That's where the institution gathers and decides that's good teaching, that's worth public recognition. And that's very important to anyone who wins that kind of an award. And so groups themselves, just by their existence, will sometimes create war rewards which are really meaningful only to the members of, of the group itself. Um, fourth, achievement of goals is sometimes possible only in a group situation. If you're a member of a football team, if you happen to get out there with 10 players instead of 11, you're, not, you're going to be at an active disadvantage. So in that case, you really need to have all 11 players there for football, all five on the court for basketball. And in fact, scoring, I've never seen the data, but I'll bet you more than an average number of points are scored in hockey, team, in hockey games when a, a player is sitting in the penalty box, when there's, a, when there's a player disadvantage. I am sure that there are more points scored under those, um, under those conditions, unless everybody is so annoyed that they play above their potential. I mean, that is, that is also a possibility. But achievement of goals sometimes is achievable only in a group situation. And finally, you and I live in such a relatively safe world that you might not think about this, but actual defense is another reason why we have such groups. Um, do you remember the first time you ever babysitted? Babysat, I should say. Um, I'll bet it was a lot easier to do when you had a friend with you. 
uh, because that way the creaking of the pipes was not necessarily somebody immediately breaking in and intent on doing mayhem on your body. So that there is some advantage to, to pooling of, of resources. On campus here, um, our campus is actually safer than two major state universities in Texas, which will not be named, but they're bigger than we are. Uh, our campus is actually safer statistically than those two campuses are. But we do still have a buddy system and, and, a, uh, and a company system that's available on post, you know, uh, telephone boxes all over campus. So at night, if you need to get from point A to point B, you can get somebody to come with you to do that. And again, that's just that's a benefit of, of groupness or a reason why groups exist is, uh, is shared defense. Um, now in turn, let's also look at some of the benefits that, that come to us from groups. One of them is, is um, in terms of the performance of groups versus individuals. There is a whole literature that has evolved out of this, which I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time uh, talking about here, again, in the interest of time. But larger numbers of people generally increases the odds that any specific problem will be solved, although there's a limit. I mean, if you get to the point where you're talking about the city of Houston as a group, by then you've divided into political factions and, and um, Democrats are yelling at Republicans, each of them thinking they've got a better answer to how to solve things. So there are limits to that. But certainly, um, if, if, if one person can solve a problem in an hour, two people theoretically might be able to solve it in, in 30 minutes, three in 20 minutes, and so forth. But there's a limit. When you get five million, they're not going to solve any given problem in, you know, in, in, a, in a fraction of a second. So there is a trade-off in terms of size as opposed to the, the, the ability to have the individuals uh, solve the effect. But one of the benefits you do get out of groups is what's called a synergistic effect. And that is that when you have uh, multiple people together, sometimes the idea of one will spark some thoughts in a second, which each of them sitting alone in a closet might not have necessarily thought about. So there are a variety of different reasons. Collective judgments generally tend to be better than, than individual judgments. Problem solving tends to be more efficient in a group situation than, than when working alone. And yet there are some, some differences that may also crop up in this kind of a, um, a situation. Uh, as I said, the matter of efficiency is, is one of them that, that kind of puts a limit on, on how groups will in fact um, work effectively together. Um, there are a variety of different pressures for, for, uh, for forming groups. Um, and uh, what I want to do is to talk specifically about, uh, about a couple of those. One is simply hereditary urges to, to, uh, to form groups. Harlow's work, going all the way back to looking at, at mother love and, and, and the importance of contact as, as a bonding device between infants and, and their respective parents, um, suggests that, in fact, um, heredity does play a role. Um, when you raise rhesus monkeys in isolation, for instance, um, and then show them pictures of infants when they have not interacted with, with either with their siblings or with any other monkey at that point, they still show very visible signs of pleasure. Um, and that would suggest then that that's an inborn, you know, that there is an identification that we do with fellow members of, of our species that is inborn. Um, by the same token, rhesus monkeys that have been raised in isolation who are then shown a threatening picture of a monkey, of a rhesus monkey in a threat posture, will show emotion and distress. And this without ever having any prior interactive experience. So that there, there is evidence to suggest that, that some of the, the affiliative capacities that we exhibit may in fact be, um, be inherited. But there's also an even larger array of, of environmental clues that, that make it clear that, that learning plays a, an important role in, in, uh, in the, the fact that we do socialize, that we tend to form in, uh, into groups. Socialization is one of the things that clearly goes on here. That is the, the learning processes that, that each generation passes on to the next younger generation um, is a, a socialization process. And we've also got cultural um, effects that, that occur, again, in the interest of time and because this is in the simple psych book, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this. But it basically influences us, culture influences us in a massive and pervasive way. You and I are a product of the culture in which we are raised. And that's purely an environmental impact on why we behave in the ways that we do. I want to pick out a specific example of a pure group-based process, though, that I think is worth talking about. And this is what's called groupthink. Groupthink is basically um, a, a, it is the case that groups occasionally make wrong decisions. They all get together and make a wrong decision. The classic example of that was, was and what actually initiated this whole program of research, was the fact that the, the, the cabinet of President John Kennedy in the 1960s made what turned out to be a disastrous decision to invade Cuba. 
And the question then came up after the fact, how could all of these bright Harvard slash Yale educated people who were in fact a very bright cabinet make such an obviously wrong decision in retrospect? And that led to an investigation of what is now called groupthink. It was identified through the study of these kinds of activities that there are actually three different things that happen that may go wrong and lead to groupthink. One of these is the illusion of invulnerability. That is groups when, when groupthink is going to be the net result out of it, will sometimes get the idea that they are invulnerable to uh, everyday pressures. Um, and certainly in the instance of Kennedy's cabinet, during the first year or two, they had been elected in a, in a very narrow victory. But in fact, the president himself was quite popular. And even from his inaugural address onward, ask not what you can do for your country, what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That theme became very much a bonding agent for the, for the um, population as a whole uh, and led to a, a considerable solidity behind him. But regardless of that, the cabinet operated under the assumption that, hey, we're in here for two more years, three more years. They can't touch us now. We need to go ahead and take care of Cuba. So they, had, they were operating under the illusion of invulnerability. Secondly, another illusion has to do with the illusion of unanimity. And this is an interesting, purely social psychological effect. You go into a meeting thinking to yourself, this is goofy. This is a bad idea, but I'm going to lay low a little bit and see what others seem to think. If everybody else comes into the meeting with that particular perspective and nobody ends up speaking up, the net result is everyone in the room walks away thinking, I must be the only person in here who thinks this is goofy. And what ends up being created psychologically is the illusion of unanimity. And that tends to happen in group situations because it's facilitated by a third element that also crops up, and that is social pressure for conformity. In the instance of, Robert, of, of um, John Kennedy's presidency, a retrospective was done on that particular fiasco afterwards. Uh, and it turned out that Dean Rusk, then Secretary of State, and Robert Kennedy, at that time Attorney General, were both on the phones on the evenings pressuring people to stick with the boss. The president wants this one. Uh, stick with him, and let's get, get through this and solve the Cuba problem. Uh, so there was, in fact, considerable, considerable pressure for social conformity in this, uh, in this situation. Um, finally then, what are the factors that, that, uh, that impact and encourage this kind of thing to occur? Well, there are in fact several things that, that, um, that do so. Um, one is um, the, the presence of um, a large and powerful leader. If there is cohesion in the group, if the group is isolated from the normal kind of give and take, if there is a very strong assertive leader who is operating in the environment, and if there is an important decision to be made, all of those are factors that tend to lead toward groupthink. Now the groupthink situation in the instance of Cuba happened to the, the Democrats. Just so the Republicans don't walk away feeling too cocky, let me remind you that the Republican Party encountered a similarly serious problem about 20 years later in the instance of the Watergate uh, phenomenon, where they, a subgroup of them decided to break into Democratic National Headquarters. And that is incident, and the associated lyings and cheatings that went on around it ultimately brought down Richard Nixon. That has forced him into a resignation. And the, the Palace Guard, the book by um, um, Bernstein and, I'm going to block on the other name, is it Wallace? Uh, but Bernstein and somebody wrote a book called The Palace Guard, which was a retrospective on what happened in the, um, in the Watergate fiasco. And there, were, there was social pressure there. The plumber's unit, which was part of, of, the, um, of the Republican Party, was actually appointed to plug leaks. And literally what they were doing was viewing it as a, as a Watergate phenomenon. And, and plugging leaks was, was one of the pressures for social cohesion that occurred in that. So there is an exact parallel in, in several other circumstances that, ha that would um, justify the various factors that, that have, um, have led to groupthink kind of phenomena. Preventing it is equally easy. Um, first of all, what you do is to get the reaction of outsiders who are neutral. Secondly, encourage orthogonal thinking. That is, if, if you might even go so far as to appoint a devil's advocate. That is, the bottom line is don't criticize critics. Recognize that they are in there for the same reasons you are. That is the, the, the good of the common group. So you don't want to criticize critics. Assign people to be a devil's advocate. Um, engage in some group process. For instance, if you've got a group of 35 and there is some fear of groupthink, divide them into seven groups of five and give each of them the opportunity to, to interact at, at the level of five and then put any questions they have, any concerns on a big, you know, two by three sheet of paper, bring those all in, post them in the room without identifying who actually authored it, and then work through each of them. 
and let each person then analyze, you know, is this a problem? If so, why? If not, why not? Because if it's a good idea, it will withstand that kind of critical examination. And make sure that the leader does not declare him or herself too early. That's key to fostering uh, neutral discussion. Now, let's look at, at a group run amok, and that is essentially a mob. A mob is basically simply a large group. And one, uh, some people have argued the idea that there is a group mind that exists that occurs in, the, in these kind of general clustered situations. I'm going to argue strongly, no. There is no group mind that exists somehow in a mind that doesn't exist in, in, a, in a group situation. A group is nothing more than a cluster of individuals. Each individual retains the ability to think. And if a mob action occurs, we have to look somewhere else to find out what the explanation is for what actually went on. Specifically, in mob situations, what I'm going to say has actually occurred there. I would identify the key ingredient in that situation being de-individuation. And I speak here from some experience. I was actually in the dorms at the University of South Carolina during the Vietnam conflict when tear gas was being sprayed on the street by police officers. And in essence, what was going on there was a classic example of de-individuation. Because one of the classic strategies of the police is to wear the uniform so that the, the group identification and the power is there. And I don't fault them for that. I mean, that's the reason they are uniform. But what was happening during Vietnam was the officers were taping their badges. So that in the pressure of conflict, even if they did do something wrong, they couldn't be identified after the fact. And that was a widely identified element of why there was some considerable confrontation between university students and police, because the police were de-individualizing themselves. They were becoming police, yes, but not identifiable. And that led to some, some very unfortunate incidents on the part of the police. The students were no better in the sense that there were some things that the students did, that, that, and they took advantage simply of, of the inability to be identified individually. And I would argue that the primary thing that leads to, well, you think about the Ku Klux Klan. It operates by, by dressing people in white sheets and putting a hood over their head. And no wonder they engage in the kind of activities that they do, because they can't be individually identified. And it's a classic example of de-individuation. Many years ago, at my school, the University of Rochester, um, I was in the dorms as an undergraduate at a time when the men were still held separately from the women. And that, in any campus, produces some very predictable tensions that will play out every spring. And on our campus, it was called panty raids, where in essence what would happen is at some point, word would sweep through the dorms that the men were going to gang up and attack the dorms of the women at night. Well, at Rochester, there was a dorm. It was a, um, um, a Hilton hotel-like structure. It was seven stories high, and it housed about 1,000 women in four, four wings of a huge dorm that had one entry. And the women were under curfew. That is, you had to be in at night by 10.30, or there were very adverse conditions, including ultimately getting bounced out of school if you habitually violated the curfew. So there was a real male-female separation that existed at that time. Word came down that we were going to storm the dorms one night, and a whole bunch of us charged toward the dorms. It turned out, I suspect deliberately, that this happened on a night when all of the campus administrators were off campus. They were not there. They weren't to be seen, except for one unlucky associate dean of students who stood under the roof of these doors where there's a great deal of light, four swinging doors all by now locked, and these men, thousand sex-crazed men, charging toward this one dean who did a brilliant thing. All he did was say, Paul, what are you doing here? And he named first and last name John, and he named two names, you know, first and last name there. He named about four campus leaders who were right at the front and tagged them by name and said, what are you doing here? And they immediately turned around, go back, bad idea, stop. And in essence, what had happened there was that the, the anonymity had been removed. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they knew quite accurately that if anything did go wrong, and of course it never did, um, that they were going to be on the dean's office carpet the next morning trying to explain why they'd been at the forefront leading the, the men. And in essence, that mob immediately turned into a group of very humble undergraduates. The whole thing collapsed, and we all went home. Now, understand that the women were not innocent in this. There were very evocative dances going on behind shades. So there was a lot of incentive to get into that dorm. Understand that was shared guilt in that case. But it was de-individuation that, that, uh, that caused that one to, um, to collapse. Now, one of the problems we have, and I want to sound this as a caution before we get into looking at, at pure social psychology here, is that you and I are part of an ongoing continuum, which is our lives. Okay? 
the dependent variables are fairly easy to spell out, group activity, individual responses in a given situation. The bigger problem we have is what is the independent variable? What is the causative event for a given situation? To illustrate this, let me show you what the, what the ultimate variable problem is. Do you remember going on a trip with your parents in elementary or junior high school? You took a vacation, maybe it was a driving trip leaving Houston, going to, to San Antonio in the dead of summer, in, in the heat of late July, early August. And as things head west, um, the air conditioner begins to break down. But they plunge onward, no, we've only got two weeks, we're going to do this. Okay? And the usual solution is that you have to create a zone for each kid. If you're lucky enough to have a station wagon, then it's easy. One kid gets one seat, the other kid gets the back seat, and you're fine. But in the traditional car, which most families have, Bubba gets one side and Sissy gets the other side, and there's a DMZ, a demilitarized zone between them, right? <laughs> if you're a brother in this situation, you're driving west and you notice that Sissy's notebook has drifted over into the DMZ. So you push it back and just remind her that's nobody's land. And a little bit later, her, her notebook has not only drifted over into the DMZ, darn it, it's on your half of the seat, which is a clear violation. So you push it back and slap her knee. She slugs your shoulder and you mash her in the nose. And mom then turns around and asks the universal question, okay, who started it? And you give the standard answer. She did. And she in turn gives the standard retort, he did. And in essence what happens is she then says, he slugged my nose. You indicate she tapped my shoulder. And she indicates you hit my knee. And in essence, what happens is you're playing the entire scene in reverse, looking for the ultimate independent variable. We have to be careful when we look at social psychological phenomena in identifying what actually constitutes the ultimate independent variable. Because you and I are in a constant, we're in a flow, okay? And it's a little bit, um, I'm grappling for the right word here. I think it's wrong of a social psychologist to look at a given scenario and try to identify the independent variable unless there has been some very careful research that's gone into identifying what we're actually manipulating in a given situation. Just be aware of the fact that when we start trying to identify independent variables, that can be a little tricky sometimes in social psychology. Let me show you one of my favorite early studies. This was a research strategy developed by Ravens and Ekus way back in the 1960s. And what they set about to do was to look at the interaction that goes on in group situations and what the dynamics are that control what is actually going on in this. What they did was to create essentially a triangular table where each person at the corner had a screw mechanism that they could twist to raise or lower their part of the table. What they had in front of them was a series of uh, carpenter's levels. So player A in the green condition here has a carpenter's level which is, is crosswise to him as I've just indicated in the diagram there, okay? Stick with the TV here for a minute for the, with the PowerPoint because I want to I wanna illustrate specifically what's going on. In this situation, player A has a carpenter's level that is exactly crosswise to them as diagrammed there. What that means is that where B and C level their table, their part of the table, determines totally whether the bubble is going to be centered. So the group goal here is to get your bubble centered, and in this case you have total interdependence. Okay? A, B, and C all have carpenter's levels that are crosswise to them, and therefore whether their bubble is centered is entirely determined by where the other two players adjust their part of the table. Okay? Do you see what I'm diagramming here? That is, in that case, in the green condition, you have total interdependence. All right? Everybody must cooperate with everybody else. We can actually do something different on this table if we go to the red condition. Now look what happens. Now in this case what we've done is to put the carpenter's level so that everybody's carpenter's level is pointing toward the center. What that results in is it doesn't matter where A and C are, if you're player B you can crank to a position halfway between. So in that case what you create is a totally competitive situation because everybody is totally independent of everybody else. I don't care where you put your carpenter, your, your level, your, le your end of the table. I can crank to a position halfway between and center my bubble under that condition. What makes this interesting is condition C in, in the blue condition over here. What they did in this case was to put A and C levels pointing toward each other. So what that meant was that A and C totally controlled what went on the table. That is, A and C become essentially a clique. 
because they can put their, their they can level their two positions at the table. Doesn't matter where B is in that condition, he gets points only depending on the good graces of C. And there, there happens to be a travel limiter so that A and C can level in an area that B may or may not be able to get to, then you have created a clique, a power group that has differential access to the resources that are being distributed there. And sure enough, what happens is A and C run their point value up because they center relative to each other, so they both get points. Poor B is left as an outsider under those conditions. And so in essence, what they were able to do in this very abstract condition was to, was to isolate the, the key elements of what goes into a group situation. Things like group size, for instance, has a direct geometric impact on, on the variety of, of coalitions that may develop in this kind of a situation. If you have only two people in the group, the only possible option is A cooperating with B. But if you add a third person, as in this situation, a can cooperate with B or C, B can cooperate with A or C, and you've got an ABC combination. So there are four possible options when you have three players. If you get to four players, there are 11 possible cliques that can be formed, and it goes up geometrically. So in essence, as the group size continues to increase, the number of subgroup possibilities just goes up explosively. And then you arrive at the University of Houston, and you can't imagine the number of groups and subgroups and other groups that may actually form in this kind of an environment. Now, let's look at interaction process analysis. This is a very complex table, which is represented in the, um, in the simple psych book. So I'm just going to actually talk about elements of that table rather than the table itself, because it's too much to put on one screen. Um, this was some work that, that was one of the early attempts to bring in and categorize what's actually going on in, in a group situation. And there's been some interesting stuff that came out of this original work on the part of Bales. Um, one of the things that he identified was the, the different types of leaders that are required in a given situation. Or the other way to think of this is, is different types of tasks. But in essence, one of the things that came out of this work is the idea that some groups are formed for task purposes. Okay, The Department of Psychology that I work in is a task-oriented group. That is, we are formed as a group to perform a particular task within the university. If you work at a grocery store, the entire team that, that serves groceries or offers groceries for sale is a task-oriented group. But in other situations, fraternities and sororities, for instance, a group is really formed for a social purpose rather than a task orientation. So in this case, in some instances, you have task type leaders as a, um, as a grocery store does or as your work environment does. And those people tend to be relatively directive in most instances. On the other hand, if you have a social task, which is the primary a social function, which is the primary reason your group is together, the orientation and the type of leader that will work effectively there often is not the same. For instance, if you think about where you work, that is a task-oriented group. And I'll bet you the person that organizes the party in that group is not the boss. There is a social leader in an organization. What I'm suggesting is that we have, we have a task orientation and superimposed on top of any task group will tend to be a social organization, which may be very different. The power figures socially in your organization are probably very different from the people who give you the checks. That is, the, the task leaders often are not the social leaders in a given organization because we cluster ourselves, we organize ourselves for very different reasons under different conditions. We also have different types of actions that may be achieved in these, um, in these groups, in the, in the organization. Some of them are, are what are called positive, uh, positive contributions in general. Um, in the table that you're, that you're looking at there, the positive reactions are things like seeming friendly and so forth. Um, there is a negative counterpart to that that may occur, and that is uh, seeming unfriendly, showing tension, uh, disagreeing and so forth. Those do not tend to advance the group toward, toward solution. Another way to divide the group is in terms of questions as opposed to answers. If you're asking questions, although the ultimate goal may be to advance the group, it isn't until you get the answers that you really advance the group forward. So in some ways, questions actually retard groups rather than advancing them. Okay? And in that way, then, we can divide it either as, as uh, positive or negative, questioning or answering. Um, there are a couple of other things I can also point out, however. One is the type of specific response categories that are given there, whether you're seeming friendly or seeming unfriendly, and the others that you can look at for yourself there. Finally, then, ultimately, there are a variety of different types of actions or impact is what that should really say. That's a typo. Uh, you can see where I was copying from when I created that. Type of impact is what we're really talking about, and those can be quite varied. 
in individual groups, depending on whether you're questioning or answering, supportive or unsupportive, and so forth. So that early work of Bales and the interaction process analysis really led to some very sophisticated work during the course of the years. One of the first ones that I want to share with you and just start it, because we'll have to come back and look at it later, is to look at the different kinds of communications that can occur in a group. And open communication is really dealing with the potential for what can occur. Um, a closed communication, a group that, that doesn't tend to foster communication, boxes themselves in and is left only with what might have occurred. We'll pick up and look at communication networks in the next program. <laughs>